last podcast, uh, if I could just do a quick recap for you guys. Uh, give me a second. Um, yeah, so in the last podcast, and again, I'm like shamelessly plagiarizing from this great article written by Edmund Wallstein uh, of the Orders of the Cistercian, which hopefully we can get linked in the, the uh, description below. Uh, this is also on the Josias website, so if you haven't heard of the Josias, I would, I rec I would recommend it as a good way to um, figure out the church's teaching on um, the relationship between the church and state, but just a lot of political, political, um, political questions in general um, concerning the church. All right, so as I said last time, uh, we started... We started before, in the ancients, we looked at the ancients to, to discern what the end of man was. And if we looked at, when looking at Aristotle, we discerned that um, the end of man has something to do with uh, all of mankind because man is a political animal. And as Aristotle says, for even if the end is the same for a single man and for a state, that of the state seems at all events something greater and more complete. So the end of the state is, is greater than the end of, the, end of man. And we can see this by comparing uh, common goods to normal goods. So if you have a boy with like an ice cream cone, that is a non-divisible good. It's uh, not something that can be multiplied and shared among many. There's only so much of the ice cream cone to be enjoyed. Um, but a common good would be something like the sun, where your enjoyment of the sun does not Im impede on anybody else's enjoyment of the sun. So uh, in, in a political context, this would be things like you know, public infrastructure like roads. Your use of the road doesn't impede on or intrude on anybody else's use of the road, and yet it's a it's a common good that helps you go places and and do stuff. Um, and this all seems well and good, but um, now comes along Christianity, and in Christianity we're taught that uh, the beatific vision is the end of the ultimate end of man not the uh not the common good of man in a state as in the as in the as a temporal realm would indicate uh so how do we reconcile this uh conflict well um this has to do with the uh the the comparison between the our heavenly end and our temporal end uh is also found in the comparison between grace and nature Grace fulfills and perfects nature, but does not abolish it. In the same way, our heavenly end um, builds on and perfects the temporal end of living virtuously within the state, within the police, um, but doesn't abolish that. So the temporal end is still something legitimate to be sought after. Um, it's just that the heavenly end is the ultimate end. Um, and because it is the ultimate end, it is to be preferred or given more weight than the, than the temporal end. And this goes back to a letter that Pope Gelasius wrote, where he said that there are two powers by which this world is chiefly ruled, that of the um, sacred authority of the priests and the royal power. And then he goes on to argue that the sacred power is um, superior to the temporal power. Uh, but that is not all. So uh, it's not a monarchy where the spiritual power has complete control over the temporal power, but rather a diarchy. That's why this view is called the Gelasian diarchy. And um, it's a diarchy because both the temporal realm, both the ruler of the temporal realm and the ruler of the church, the Pope, they both get their, um, their authority directly from God. Um, so the temporal end doesn't get their authority through the church. Like it's not like the church is passing on authority to the temporal power. Um, rather, the temporal power is legitimate um, on its own, but it, sorry, it's not legitimate, it's, it's, uh, um, the sacred, the, it has its power directly from God, so it has its own purview that the, the heaven, that the, um, spiritual realm, the church, cannot impinge upon, but that temporal, but it still has to submit itself in, in matters pertaining to salvation of souls to the church, Force authority in those other realms, and that in those other realms, to be legitimate. Um, and we saw that the reason why this is split up this way is because of sin. If there was no sin, then there, then the relationship between church and state would be a monarchy. But because of sin, we have 
that um, God wants to remove the church from having to deal with temporal matters. That's why he says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Um, and that's also why he says, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Um, okay, so I think that's an adequate, adequate enough summary of the previous uh, video. And now for those uh, still unconvinced or those who are just to give a more fuller um, treating of this in, in papal doctrine just to see that it's not just Lazius the first in the 490s who's saying this but it's really something that's repeated by popes over and over and over again throughout the course of history we're, today we're going to go through what um, a bunch of different posts have said on this, the teaching of, of the Gelasian diarchy and hopefully we'll see by the end of this that um, this truly is the teaching of the Catholic Church with regards to the uh, relationship between church and state so I mentioned I already mentioned Gelasius's letter where he says there are two by which the power by which the world is chiefly ruled um, and the next the next Pope to argue for uh, for an aspect of this Gelasian diarchy is Pope Gregory the Great who argues for the subjection of the temporal power to the spiritual here's what he says Power over all people has been conceded from on high to the one who governs, such that the earthly kingdom would be a service which subordinates itself to the heavenly kingdom. Um, so we see that word subordinate there, indicating that the temporal realm is subordinate to the heavenly realm. Um, then, we f then we have Pope Boniface VIII famously in Unam Sanctum saying that there are two swords which ought to govern. Um, and here is that quote in Wow, it's, uh, I kind of took a big chunk out of that. But here's the, this quote, so bear with me here as I read this. We are informed by the text of the Gospels that in this church and in its power are two swords, namely the spiritual and the temporal. For when the apostles say, Behold, here are two swords, Luke 22, uh, chapter 22, verse 38, that is to say, in the church, since the apostles were speaking, the Lord did not reply that there were too many, but sufficient. Certainly the one who denies that the temporal sword is in the power of Peter has not listened well to the word of the Lord commanding, put up thy sword into thy scabbard. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. Uh, he's saying that to Peter. Both, therefore, are in the power of the church, that is to say, the spiritual and the material sword, but the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church. The former in the hands of the priest, the latter by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. However, one sword ought to be subordinated to the other, and temporal authority is subjected to spiritual power. So I think I mentioned this quote in last uh, in the last podcast, but just to make sure, you know, just to go over this again, um, this quote is not repudi repudiating the Gelasian diarchy as it, as it might seem at first glance. At first glance, it, it may seem like, wait a second, he's saying that one sword is administered for the church and one by the church, doesn't that mean the church kind of has complete control over both both realms? Well, no. The Gelasian diarchy is still um, intact here because the temporal power is is wielded by the hands of kings and soldiers. So it's still wielded by kings and soldiers. It's just that the sword has to be wielded for the purpose of the salvation of the uh, salvation of souls. It has to be subordinated in that way. So if we imagine. God giving out these two swords to each to each one. They are each receiving um, power from God immediately and not the temporal power immediately through the spiritual power. So it's still a diarchy, um, not a not a monarchy. Um, okay, so that is Pope Boniface VIII Unam Sanctum. That was in that was a papal bull in the early thirteen hundreds. Um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, who was a 19th century pope i think he also lived in the 20th century um but i'm not sure when exactly this was written but this is from his encyclical immortale dei um he says the almighty therefore has given the charge of the human race to two powers the ecclesiastical and the civil the one being set over divine and the other human things each in its kind is supreme but inasmuch as each of these two powers has authority over the same subjects god who foresees all things and who is the author of these two powers has marked out the course of each in right correlation to the other 
The nature and scope of that connection can be determined only by having regard to the nature of each power and by taking account of the relative excellence and nobleness of their purpose. One of the two has for its proximate and chief object the well-being of this mortal life, the other the everlasting joys of heaven. Whatever, therefore, in things human is of a sacred character, whatever belongs either of its own nature or by reason of the end to which it is referred, to the salvation of souls, or to the worship of God, is subject to the power and judgment of the church. Whatever is to be ranged under the civil and political order is rightly subject to the civil authority. So we can see here that um, Pope Leo XIII is kind of delineating the, the scope of these two uh, of these two realms and making it clear that they be, each have their own unique role in um, governing. Uh, and this is um, okay. So this is Edmund Waldstein's paraf paraphrasing of this quote: Leo the uh, position is is such that integration should have juridical form. That is that the earthly power should explicitly and officially recognize the authority of the church and form its laws in accordance with church law. Um, all right. So, all right. So the next one, the next few um, that I have here, this has to do with uh, St. Thomas and his teaching. And I also have next to me a book written by St. Robert Bellamy that William got me. Uh, so I'm going to present on St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Robert Bellarmine's opinions on this next week. Um, but I also wanted to mention maybe one or two more sources here that back up this teaching of the Delisian Diarchy. Uh, give me a second here. Ah, here we go. So Gregory the Seventh in, in 1075, um, they, uh, there's a document attributed to him called Dictatus Pape, which are 27 dictates of the Pope. And um, one of them is uh, that it may be permitted to him, to the Pope, to depose emperors, clearly showing that the church is, um, uh, that, the, that the emperor is subordinate to, the, to papal authority. And as I think St. Thomas will get into later, or St. Robert Bellamy, I, I can't remember which, um, this doesn't mean he can just oppose emperors willy-nilly. He has to have a just cause to do so, but he still can um, if he has that just cause. Uh, and finally, there's also one of the other dictates is that the Pope may absolve subjects from their fealty to wicked men. Um, all right, So, and this was in, written in 1075 by Gregory VII, uh, Dictatus Pape. And if I'm not mistaken... Um, let me see. Uh, I think there's like another encyclical where um, either uh, here, give me a second. Sorry. Oh, no, it's not there. Man, okay, I don't think I'm finding it now, but I think uh, either in the article, it might be in the article, or it might be in one of these encyclicals that I have on the side. I think um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth or Pope Pius X said something like it's a crime for the state not to submit itself to God, at least. But I think they might have also said the Church or something like that. I'll have to. I'm going to try to dig that up. Which Pope was that? Time. I think one of them said that. Uh, it's a crime for the state not to sub subordinate itself to the church or something like that, um, if it's able to. Mm -hmm. um, but I will. I don't want to like float that out there without having the text in front of me. So I'm gonna do some research next time and see if I can track that down. Um, but yeah, I think that's. I think that's about it. And just to recap, um, we see the same teaching. In Gelasius the first, you see the teaching of Gelasian diarchy, which again is is the teaching that the that power is given to both the temporal realm and the spiritual realm, um, temporal ruler and spiritual ruler immediately and not immediately, and that the but that the temporal realm has to subordinate itself to the spiritual ruler uh, for its power to be legitimate and binding, um, and this is a diarchy, 
not a monarchy because of sin and because of the necessity of the church to remove itself from temporal matters as um, Christ says to Peter, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Um, and we see this teaching expressed first in Gelasius the, Pope Gelasius I in the 490s. We see it again in, uh, we see the uh, doctrine that the temporal realm should be subordinate to the spiritual in Pope Gregory the Great. We see that the, we see again that emperors should be under should be uh, can be deposed by the Pope. Uh, we see that written by Pope Gregory the Seventh in 1075. We see the promulgation of the uh, the bull uh, by Boniface VIII. In that one, we see the the two swords kind of come up again and and link back to what Gelasia said. And then we see again in Pope Leo the Thirteenth in Immortality Day uh, delineate the realm. The uh, scope of each of the two uh, powers and making it clear that um, though they each have their own jurisdiction, the temporal is subordinate to the spiritual. All right, any uh, questions, comments uh, on that? Mm. Uh, let's see, uh, William, do you have any? Because uh, if not, I will go first. Um, I don't really have any comments or questions regarding specifically anything you mentioned but i haven't read the full full article um does it talk at all about the book of judges oh no i don't think so okay because that would be an interesting that would be another interesting topic to add because a lot of um i know a lot of people that christians that are against like monarchy and stuff i i don't think we're specifically talking about monarchy alone right right uh, um, yeah so i should i should yeah. I, yeah i should make that distinction too i'm talking about uh, the relationship between church and state not necessarily the composition of the state itself but it is true that saint thomas aquinas and others have taught that monarchy is the ideal form of government and that is something that i would also agree with so okay then I guess my question no longer stands. I'll let Michael <laughs> go ahead. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess it's probably more of a comment than a question, but um, sure. there is uh, uh, I, I'm more of a, a Gregorian in this sense, but like it, uh, and by that I mean it's like there, there's definitely the separation of uh, the church and state as regards their uh, as regards their essence, you know, the the uh, governing or leading towards the greatest temporal good versus the ultimate end or ultimate good of man. Um, but then there's also, uh, but also the separation of church and state should not be absolute as as uh, some uh, modern as some modernist and postmodernist uh, philosophers like it to be um and the reason why is because precisely because the church has something to say about about how to govern people or what what uh what governments should be leading the people towards and because the church has a say in that there is a measure of subjection of temporal rulers to that of uh church authority Precisely because the church, in its fullness of truth, has something to say about how uh, about um, how rulers should conduct temporal matters. Um, so there is definitely a subjection that does that need that that is needed. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, nevertheless, it they're they're both the church and the state are not the same. So they shouldn't be treated as the same. It's just that with the arrival of Christianity, the sword that is now that that was in the hand of kings and soldiers now has somebody else to answer to. Whereas before Christianity, um, it like the state was supreme. Right. So yeah. that's my comment. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's an excellent point. And in the in the uh, so next time we're gonna go over. Uh, St. Robert Bellarmine and St. Thomas Aquinas' views on this. And um, St. Robert Bellarmine goes into a little bit more. I haven't actually read all of the entire section myself, but he goes into a lot more detail 
um, about what precisely this relationship between the church and state means and how far it goes. And then after that, in the episode after that, I was hoping to go back to the article that we linked and go over the second and the fourth sections. The second one being, uh, I think it's called Augustinian radicalism. Basically the idea that uh, the church and state are like radically opposed to each other and that uh, the church, they're, it's almost like, I think, it, I think it has to do with like Christian anarchy, the Christian anarchy movement in the early 20th century. Um, and it's most power, uh, forceful or most well-known proponent was Dorothy Day, I think, uh, or at least that's what the article said. Uh, so there's that extreme, but then you also get the other extreme, which is more prevalent nowadays, as you were just saying, Michael, of Whig Thomism, which is basically, the, uh, basically what most people interpret the Second Vatican Council, Dignitatis Humani is saying that the states basically don't have to acknowledge the church at all, and they get to get to ignore them on them on pretty much anything. Um, and that help, that view is also held by a few um, Catholics nowadays, um, but is definitely few. contrary. Is <laughs> definitely contrary to um, the Gelasian diarchy, um, but. The hope is is that we'll be able to see more clearly what the what the the legitimate spheres of influence are by kind of holding up a candle to the darkness and seeing where the seeing seeing by contradiction how how, how things stack up um yeah and then uh maybe in the episode after that we'll get into the actual uh dignitati sumani uh document and and see what, what's in there um but uh, yeah, I think we're, we're heading on close to an hour here. So anybody with any final comments, uh, questions, concerns, anything like that? Um, I guess, uh, just, uh, you know, one quick question. Um, sure. uh, did, uh, I couldn't hear exactly what you said, but, uh, did, uh, did you comment that, uh, I was a proponent for Whig Thomism? No, I, did I couldn't not. hear that. No. I oh, don't. okay. No, 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 no. Oh, it, it's just, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, uh, no, 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 no. It, it's no. on the other end of the spectrum. Right, right, right. You're, no, yeah. no, no, what you were saying is completely in line with, with, uh, with what I was laying out. I was saying that there was a, um, two views on either side of it that are oh, contrary I getcha. to it. So no, I wasn't labeling you as a wig, Thomas. Uh, I okay. Would... I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to clear something up before we, before we end here. <laughs> Good to clarify that. <laughs> He, he almost lost his entire reputation at St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you, Michael. Um, uh, uh, all right. Okay, but um, other than that, no, I'm I'm satisfied with where we're with where we're at. 